Welcome to another episode of the Carry Trainer Higher Line Podcast. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Higher Line Podcast. We've got a special guest today. You may have seen her completely naked on television at one point or somewhere else. I don't know. How, <laughs> how the hell does a young lady decide to just go on the TV naked? Well, the funny thing is they didn't tell me I was going to be naked when I first signed up. All so right. we were the first non-pilot episode they ever filmed. Oh. And it was still kind of a concept when they told me about it. So it was pitched to me like, oh, hey, you know, you're a survivalist. You'll go out. It'll be great. You'll have no items. You'll, you know, be able to only take one thing. You're gonna be with a stranger in a remote place that you're not gonna know about. And I'm like, this sounds great. Like, this is how I live my life. And then came the little side, like, well, there's a slight chance, a slight chance that you might not even have clothes. I was like, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> what are you talking about? First of all, my mom's gonna kill me. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was a slight chance. And then the next thing I know, I'm walking out naked onto a deserted island with a total stranger. Hilarious. So you're Laura Zara, mm -hmm. right? You're from New Hampshire. So I lived in New Hampshire and that's kind of what I call home, but I was okay. actually born in Massachusetts okay. and I've been traveling for the better part of my life, but Montana is home now and it's been home on and off since 2003. So cool. I don't really have a home. I'm homeless. Homeless, but you look like you're in a home. Yeah, I am. I have great friends. <laughs> Lots of so, places. To so you get. just you just couch surf as you're moving about. Well, right now I'm actually um, I'm my roommate's Jana Waller, and I've been based here since let's see summer of 2020. Okay. And it's been really nice, like a lot of silver linings in the pandemic. I know it's a whole messed up thing, but for me, it's actually been really nice to not travel for a hot second and get to like enjoy one place and unpack my bag. So I'm I'm having fun. Plus, Montana's amazing. Yeah, Montana is great. So people that don't know you or maybe haven't seen that show, you are a, a survivalist, which I want to talk about mm -hmm. what that what that means to you. You're a knife maker. Mm -hmm. You wrote a book or books, right? Books, just one. Just one. Now. Okay. You teach. Yep. You teach these skills. Mm -hmm. What else? You're um, a you're a taxidermist. Yep. I did a stint as a butcher. I mean, I've worked every random job you can imagine, but I really just love collecting skills and learning new things. And it's interesting. I have a very small attention span. You went to online. college for uh, biology, but what kind of biology? Uh -huh. So I was really interested in ethnobiology. So kind of like how people and the natural world interact. And it was kind of, I kind of made up my own major ethnobiology. It's not really a thing, but it kind of is. Um, really, I just wanted to be a survivalist, but I thought I had to go to college. So that's what I chose. Um, it what was did the cavemen like, do to survive did, without college? I, I don't know. Well, I, I finally realized that they did survive without college. So I quit. And that was the thing in well, my you, life I'm most proud of. You didn't finish. Actually. Nope. You're most proud of quitting college. It's of, the thing I'm most uh, proud of. Of all the things you've done in your life, the most <laughs> yeah. proud moment was quitting school. And I probably should say, hey, you know what? Like, I fully support someone going to school if that's what they want to do and they have, you know, that's what they need to do to do what they want to do. But for me, I was doing it because I thought I had to. Mm -hmm. And it was the first decision I made for myself. And no one understood. No one really supported me in that. But I knew that for me, I was making a commitment to myself and what I wanted to do. And I wasn't just going to rely on plan B. I wanted to focus totally on plan A and find a way to make it happen. I knew that if I put too much effort into plan B, that was going to be a priority. So yeah, no. So when you were in high school, you didn't know what you wanted to do when you grew up, grew up. I didn't know that I could do whatever I wanted. You know, mm. it was still the time when it was like, oh, hey, you have to pick a job off of this list of jobs. You know, mm -hmm. if you want to be a nurse, a firefighter, uh, a lawyer or uh, something else. Which Did you get good grades in high school? I had great grades. Did you get I, good grades in college other than being a quitter? Oh, yeah. I got, I mean, 4.0, like, okay. top of my, right. yeah, I was doing All great. Right. Overpointing, double major and a minor. And I just, um, it just wasn't for me. It was for everyone else. I was miserable. I was totally miserable. I was living out in the Arboretum at my college. I built a shelter out there. I was hunting deer with one of my professors and picking up roadkill and trying to do all the things I wanted and then still going to classes. It was, it was a weird time. Then I realized I, I didn't need to. Was your parents upset? Oh, I think they thought I was going to end up dead in a gutter for sure. 
you know, I mean, and not because they didn't want to support me and what I wanted to do, but they also didn't realize that, you know, survivalist is uh, an option on that list that they never write down. Maybe they do now. Is there even a place for that in this modern world? Do you like, I know you can put yourself in places where uh, you need those skills, but like, do we need survivalists in this modern world? I, I can, go to, the, I can go to the grocery store. <laughs> I think, I mean, more than ever, I think people are realizing that we're so disconnected from what our own basic needs are that the littlest thing goes wrong. You know, we all saw it during the pandemic. We're having trouble getting supplies. All these different things are kind of in peril. I'm not worried because I know that worst comes to worst, I can take care of myself. Don't get me wrong. There's definitely modern amenities I enjoy when I have them, but I know I don't need them. So to, it, to, to live, to live. Yeah. yeah. And actually to be happy and to enjoy life and all those things, everything else is just a bonus. And when you can take care of your own needs, it's this freedom. And uh, I think a lot of people really realize that for the first time when everything wasn't at their fingertips at any given moment, all of a sudden you start thinking, well, what happens if there's less available? What happens if, you know, chaos breaks out and we're fighting over food? I mean, it's, it seems like a, a sci-fi novel until this, you know, past few years. And all of a sudden people are realizing like, yeah, I don't know what to do without my cell phone. And mm -hmm. it's, it's a big deal. So it's been really interesting to see how much interest has uh, kind of come up um, now. And that was never the plan. I never knew mm -hmm. that was going to be a thing, but uh, it's convenient for sure. Yeah. Sometimes all of the modern amenities and trappings that we have are, for everything they give us, they take something away. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes you don't realize it until that moment when you don't have one of them. You know, I know people who are completely intolerable if they skip lunch. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you don't know. I know lots of people like that. They're yeah. bitches. Yeah. The yeah. worst. Yeah. And um, I think for me, it's like, all right, not only do I want to know how to meet my needs, but I want to know more about the mental attitude that you know the change and the shift that happens when i don't have something what do i what am i like when i'm thirsty what am i like when i'm hungry sleep deprived and all of these things that we have pretty consistent all the time in our modern world um i mean that's something that people throughout history they they know what that's like and we don't and so um i don't know i just think it's really useful in everything to know what you're like, where your mind goes, how to take care of yourself. It's, it's interesting to me, maybe because I'm so interested in learning new things. I think it's just fascinating. Talk a little bit. I like that. So now you're talking my language mindset. So, so uh, we have this concept. It's not our concept, but we use this, this uh, simple phrase, exposure equals composure. The more you're exposed to a thing, the more you composed potentially mm -hmm. you can be in it, right? Cause you could be hungry every day. So mm -hmm. you're exposed a bunch, but you have a bad attitude every time you're hungry at lunch and you turn into an asshole, right? right? Or you could do what you're saying, like, okay, I can push through this. And of course we need to eat or have water and those things, but talk about how you uh, become aware of the internal stuff and then maybe how you apply some type of mental training or or action to it to grow. Talk yeah, about that. I, I mean, experience, is, there's no substitute for experience. I think you have to put yourself in those situations. And I, I, I think you're right. You shouldn't wait for that to come unexpectedly. You're not gonna have control over it, but if you can at least know it's coming and create that experience, then you're gonna be able to work that muscle. You know, I think that mental fortitude, it's, like, it's a muscle like anything else, right? The mental attitude you're able to hold towards the world you need to practice using it in different ways. And I think a lot of people just aim for this middle line, kind of mediocre, okay, nothing's ever too bad, but nothing's ever too great. And they just mm. kind of sit in the middle there and everything's really controlled and they're in this little bubble. But for me, when I started kind of pushing against that bubble and you know expanding that comfort zone and being like, all right, this makes me a little nervous, but I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna throw myself into the fire and I'm gonna see what happens. And then the next time your bubble's a little bigger so you can push a little further. I think for me, I've kind of become addicted to that. You know, I think I'm more comfortable feeling uncomfortable than I am feeling comfortable at this point. Um, I start feeling comfortable and I'm like, oh gosh, like I don't like this because I feel most alive when I, things are being pushed for me. But it wasn't always like that. You know, when I first started kind of going out, even, you know, I didn't grow up some feral kid. Well, I kind of did, but <laughs> it was all controlled still. I still went back to my parents' house and, uh, you know, lived with them and, um, I didn't grow up in a survivalist family. So what's your parents really, do, by the way? 
Uh, my mom is a preschool teacher and my dad's an electrical engineer. Okay. So totally different for me. Amazing. But yeah, didn't, didn't grow up doing it. It was scary. The first time I spent a night alone outside in the wilderness. Yeah, it was scary. I'd never done it before. Of course it was going to be. And the next time a little less so. And now it's, it's where I feel at home. Um, What's the longest you've stayed out alone? A month. Uh, that's about what I like feel. I usually don't go with any kind of emergency device as far as like being in touch with the outside world and sat phone um, or something like that. You're saying, yeah, I got an in reach a couple years ago. Um, but it's, it's just, I don't like, I think I do more dumb things when I have it than I should. Cause I think like it, it, like knowing that you have the safety net, you push yeah. your boundaries a little bit, jump yeah. over a Creek. That's a little too wide or something like that. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. I, I'll take these risks, but it's all an illusion. You know, even if, if I get swept away in a river, right. I mean, what, what good's it going to do me, but for mm -hmm. some reason it just creates this illusion that I have this connection. And when I don't have it, it's a completely different mindset that I go into where I'm fully aware that my actions will result in my fate. You know, if I do something stupid and I get in trouble, then either I'm going to have to get myself out of it or I'm going to die. And I, my brother, Tom is a, uh, does like uh, skydiving, rock climbing, all those kinds of things, teaches the uh, like not, not powered parachute. I forget the name of the device, but it's like a parachute that you hang in and sail around. And that's exactly what he says, why he likes it. Cause like if I, f then the cause and effect is just me and me alone, or maybe nature, maybe wind yeah. blows him into the side of a mountain, but it's still his choice to be dangling there in the sky. So kind of the same exactly. thing. Exactly. Yeah. So well, when you're it's ultimate accountability, right? Mm hmm so like yeah. when you're back here in the warm house in Montana, you don't have that feeling. No, no. And I don't, I mean, I don't want to say I don't feel alive, but I definitely have a completely different experience when I'm out there. It's like, you remember seconds of every, of every moment, you know, and then here when I'm, you know, in this world, whatever it is, I don't like calling it the real world. Uh, it's, it kind of all blends together, right? You can spend days catching up on emails, That's what I've been doing all this computer stuff. And it's like, man, one day blends into the other and it just feels like, you know, existing, but mm -hmm. when I'm out there and I'm, it's not cause I have a death wish. I just, I feel like it's, it's when I'm really feeling alive and it's, it's pretty incredible. That's why d dudes like this yeah. Emerson or yeah. those kind of guys back in the day, they're like, wait a sec, we've got sewing machines and all these crazy things like cars. I got to get the f out of here. And they went out in the bush and did the same thing. It's amazing. And you come yeah. back with a whole new perspective, you know, because when I do spend a month out there alone, I come back and I want to talk to people. I appreciate talking to people. I appreciate sleeping in a bed. I appreciate like ice from an ice machine and like drinking water that, you know, is out Where, of the tap. Where's a favorite place that you spent weeks or a month alone? Um, at the wilderness out here, honestly, like mm -hmm. there's this one wilderness here in Montana that I disappear out into and the Bob. Uh, I will give no names, Okay, all right, fair <laughs> but, enough. but you're very close. Um, all right. it's yeah, it's just, you know, when there's predators constantly around you and the weather can change in an instant and there's all these physical obstacles and you're just pushing yourself to that level. Um, it's just something that I think is really important for me to feel like, I don't know, happy. I was, I was a sad kid and it wasn't cause I didn't have a good childhood or anything. I just wasn't doing what I wanted to do. What do you mean by you were a sad kid? Uh, I cried every day of school up until like the sixth grade. I told everyone I had allergies. I was just, I was like, couldn't explain it. I was just, I hated school. I was miserable. I just wanted to, you know, be out. And I also hated wild. school, but I wasn't a baby. I didn't cry. Oh, I cried. I couldn't yeah. even, I couldn't even I'm help just it. I was kidding, a baby. calling you a baby. No, too. I wasn't. But no, I hated it. I remember <laughs> staring at the clock every day like all day long, just willing. I, I imagined every manner of evil to try to escape the school. Like if I light a fire in a garbage can down in the yeah. basement, it won't burn the building down, but it'll <laughs> set the smoke alarm off. Yeah. Like just, and they'll have to clear us out for the day. I would fabricate all kinds of fantasies to get out of there. Yeah. I, I wish I had been thinking about that. It probably would make me feel better, but, um, 
Yeah, no, I was, I hated it. I, mean, I still see a school bus and I like have PTSD. Like it's September and I'm like, oh, it's hunting season. Oh, also God, school, for some reason, I still carry that. And I'm like, oh wait, like you're an adult now. You don't have to go to school. What happens when you met a kid or you meet a kid at this time that loves school? How fascinated. Yeah, me I'm too. so fascinated. And I think it's so interesting. Like Zoom would have been, Zoom school would have been my dream. I would have been like, all right, at least I just get it over with and it's miserable, but like, at least I'm here and I don't have to actually go to that place. Mm. I don't know. I think it's so amazing that kids were really excited to go to school and that a lot of kids I meet like school. What, what are you? It's here. a different world that we live in about 10 years, 15 years ago or so. I was running a business with a friend of mine that specialized in, uh, I was in construction for years, energy efficiency. And at the time, um, we were probably some of the only people here in Illinois. The reason I know Montana is I've got friends in Helena that we worked with on this project. But anyway, we would present to like school boards and like in our state, the Illinois Department of Education talking about, you know, telling every young person to go to college. Like, what about who's going to build roads and, and fix toilets and all these things and cut meat butchers mm -hmm. and be barbers, my barbers retiring and there's no barbers left, but yeah. maybe there's not as many because we told kids, you got to become an electrical engineer or a preschool teacher and the world needs all those things, but mm -hmm. not every kid needs to, needs yeah. to be one. Especially if they don't want to, you know, mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest thing is that I, I did well in school. I got good grades. I could regurgitate information and write papers and I wasn't happy doing it, but I was capable of it. So everyone thought I should go down that path. Like what a waste it would be if I didn't do that. And I'm like, man, I would be so miserable. I, I love just like doing stuff with my hands and making stuff and creating and mm -hmm. like moving and being active. And if I, you know, I don't know what I thought I was going to be able to do, but man, it, I don't know. Nothing on that list seemed appealing when they, when they gave it to me in high school. I dig that you were able to get good grades because I did not. Um, and I, I just hated it. So I like would lie, cheat and steal to not do homework in, in uh, later life. When I did school on my own, I got good grades because I was paying for it. But, um, yeah, in school, man, I, anything to just get by, to get the frick out of there. I hated it. I thought it was my ticket out. I thought if I did well, that I would be able to. But they thought they'd let you leave. They'd oh, let Laura, you leave. did good. You well, did good on a <laughs> test yesterday. You can leave today. You can graduate at the right young age of ten. Yeah. You know, but I mean, I thought that just if I could go to school and just you know be miserable, and then I could. It's kind of what I feel like what a lot of people do with their lives. Actually, it's almost a metaphor, right? Like school sucks, but if I just do it now, then I'll be happy tomorrow, right? It's mm. like the future will be better because I'm just gonna be a good little worker now. And then I'm going to enjoy it later. And then it's like, man, you realize that life's like passed me by. And I spent my whole childhood and my, you know, the college I did go to being miserable because I, you know, I, I didn't know there was another option and I thought I had to do that. Talk for a second. You just, you said a moment ago and what triggered my memory of this talking about how life just blasts by, right? We get in this, like these tasks of wake up, morning routine emails blah 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 and the same mm -hmm. thing can happen out in the woods too mm -hmm. but you said you had like memories of seconds i think you said a minute mm -hmm. ago talk about that yeah yeah i mean it's just it's how you're so in the moment when like for me when i'm out there i'm so in the moment you know i'm paying attention to what's happening around me where i am where i'm going like all these things but it's all like in this moment, in this place, in this time, I'm not thinking about who I forgot to call or, you know, what I have to do tomorrow that I forgot about, or the list I have and the things I have to check off and all these like menial tasks. And I feel like we get pulled, especially now with, and I feel so old being like, Oh, now we have to do this, but it's true. You're right. Like we always have a cell phone. We're always accountable. People can always get in touch with us. You don't answer a text in an hour. People think you're dead. Mm -hmm. People are calling you at one in the morning. Um, we're always thinking about this to-do list and we're never actually just in that moment really now. Yeah. yeah. And that's huge. It's, it's damaging, I think, because it's like, it's not really living. It's not living at all to me. I have like moments of clarity like that. Like uh, recently on Thanksgiving with family had a nice little beer buzz going and I'm sitting there watching like all the kids. Now, most of the little guys like are older and I'm a freaking grandfather. So like there's, 
kids not like they used to be but like you know the little boys are running around smashing into shit my dad is yelling you know cut it out and i'm just laughing like people are playing music in the other room got a lot of musicians in the family and i was super content and so i wasn't like thinking about anything but all of these little bits of information that my brain was taking in and i was aware that i was relaxed and enjoying it but like those moments i was just on the water down in the keys fishing same thing like there a shark goes by there goes a flock of xyz bird that i didn't know their name because i didn't study biology in school and <laughs> you, all these little things and all of a sudden hours go by but you've seen like a million bits of information coming into your head and i think some people do that when they watch tv or like a movie they really want to see or a sports there you game. go how often do we do that in our own lives? And I think that's the problem is that for some reason, we don't think our lives and what's going on around us is important enough to take that time and sit and just be in it and experience it. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's like a shame. It's a waste because mm. it's happening and this is your life. And, you know, I think we've all had people close to us die, right? It's like, you think that everything is a given and you always have time and you have to get morbid but it's not true you know i mean it's it's crazy how years fly by and that's not morbid either that's just real it's just real you yeah, know i think real. it's it's very much one of those things where it's like man you're gonna keep saying like well you know i'm looking into getting a job i like or i'm looking into having a life i want or i'll be happy then and it's like man i, I remember meeting this one woman i was actually down in the keys and i was sitting around this campfire next to a total stranger and she starts telling me about how uh her and her husband they just both were working their butts off because they wanted to have this great retirement and they never traveled and they never took vacations because they were saving for retirement because when they retired they were going to travel and that was their whole plan and so they you know they worked and they they just kept on going through the motions and they retired when they turned 60 and they decided okay we're we're traveling now the first trip that they went on, they went, I forget where they went. It was some, some beach. They were out in a boat and they were snorkeling off of the boat. Well, she's going along, enjoying it. Can't believe what she's seeing this whole world that was like, you know, there all the time that she never experienced. And she looks up to see where her husband is and he's kind of struggling along and she's laughing at him because he's a little out of shape. And, um, then she realizes he's really struggling. So she calls the boat over, they haul him back onto the boat and realize he's in trouble, go back to the mainland. By the time they reach the mainland, he's dead literally oh, the wow. first vacation right it's like it's like a movie but it really hit me because that guy got to you know he spent his whole life waiting for that it's like it's like that Alanis Morissette song right <laughs> I'm, not big, I'm not a big Alanis not a big Alanis fan. <laughs> I got my dark hair down I'm like oh, I'm really what is the song it. what is the song is it, isn't it ironic it's like ironic that song ironic whatever it's ironic it's okay. not ironic that's the whole irony of the song anyway I digress so this woman she ended up going after that happened she lost her husband it was terrible well she was like living her best life she met some guy in italy that she started dating but she was still traveling on her own and it really just inspired her to really make the most out of life and i think it's just so sad for that for me to think about that guy and what he missed out on um and i just think a lot of people do that choices yeah yeah choices yeah that's the weird part though too people uh we adopt concepts like uh this is what my parent and this is normal right this is the religion i'm supposed to have this is how i'm supposed to go about the cadence of life school job marriage babies etc and those are all fine things but mm -hmm. some people don't want any of those things some people want all of them some people want them in different orders right and some people have that and they're still looking into the future they're not enjoying their kids when they're young in those moments mm -hmm. right they're worried about oh well i gotta get i gotta work more because i gotta get more money because we have to go on vacations and we have to do, and it's like it's just that mentality of constantly never having anything be enough and just needing more and never being like oh okay i'm looking around and i'm seeing what i have now and i think for me like when i'm out in the wilderness i experience that and it's something that i bring back and i'm just aware of not to say that i'm perfect and that i don't do that too but for me, it's like, I just need to remind myself that I don't want to be like that all the time. I don't constantly want to be focusing on what I don't have and what I want and what my future plans are. Not to say those aren't important, but if you're only, <clears throat> excuse me, thinking about them, you're missing out. You drinking beer? Yeah. Hey, it's noon. No, it's a soda water. Oh, polar <clears throat> water. Do you have siblings? I have two. 
Are they like you at all? I have a doctor and a lawyer for siblings. Okay. So they're, they're very different. They have very different lives. Um, I think there's an adventurous sense to them, but I've taken everything to the extreme. So <laughs> yeah, it's kind of, uh, we're, we're very different. I think they appreciate me now that we're adults. I think like my parents, they were probably worried about me for a bit. Um, but yeah, very different. But great, just different. <laughs> do, they live, wants... do they live back in the East Coast still? Yep, my sister still is in Massachusetts. My other one lives down in Atlanta. Okay. But, yeah. So when you guys talk, are they <clears throat> constantly telling you, sort it out, settle down, quit gallivanting, or they all accept you now? No, they're like, tell us stories. Okay. If you want to live vicariously through what you're doing because it's always crazy. Like you always have the best stories. Because they've chained themselves to the, <laughs> to the I mean, world. they still I I mean, one of my sisters, she's got, you know, three kids and she's, you know, a doctor. And so she's always busy. And I give her so much credit because they still take time to go and have experiences. But yeah, how she manages her time is beyond me. But yeah, she's got a lot more responsibility and um things going on than I do, but it's just different. I think it's like, and I look at her and I'm like, oh, she's happy. Like, that's great. She's doing what she wants to do. And my lifestyle is not for everyone. I think it's like, as long as you're finding happiness, but I am always shocked how many people I see that just, you know, all they want to do is they, Hey, how you been? I haven't seen you in forever. And oh my God, this is, they want to commiserate with you. Everything's terrible. Everything's miserable. It's woe is me. I hate my life. And then there's an excuse for everything that they that they why they can't change it like oh well why don't you do this oh well you know they don't want to change it they just what's want to your complain what's your it. viewpoint on excuses i think they're all bullshit all I of think, them uh not all of them but i think that where there's a like if there's a problem there's a solution it might not always be as easy as like oh just stop doing that you know i mean i'm fully aware of people who have uh, commitments or family issues or things that they need to, to be there for. But I think there's a way to make it better and still be happy in whatever situation it is that you're in. You know, there's a different way to relate to it. There's a different way to look at it. There's something else that you can be doing. And I think if, you know, if you're not finding it, then, um, that's kind of on you, but it's, it's hard. It's, and it's scary. And I think, um, there's just always a way I, I, I really believe that some of the people that, you know, are dealt really hard cards and they're still really happy. Um, just it's, it's incredible. Have you ever read a man's search for meaning? By oh Victor yeah. Frankel? yeah. Right. It's, like, yeah. I've just reread it for the second or maybe even third time just this past summer. Yeah. I need to reread it too, because I mean, I love that, but I think it's just so interesting how, you know, you you're as free as you want to be in your your own mind you know i mean that sounds like something on a t-shirt but i think it's true i think how you're relating to things and if you want to look for negatives there's always negatives if you want to look for positives there's always positives it's like where and do for, you want to live for you guys listening or watching if you don't know what that book is victor was a a concentration camp survivor that literally watched everybody he loved be murdered by the nazis but he had the presence of mind to compartmentalize there's something I can take away with this from this to share to the world. Cause I know I'm going to live. And he, mm -hmm. and he did, and he wrote a book and, and he lived to be like 90 something. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Just horrific. The whole first half of that book is just horror, horror, mm -hmm. just people it's being murdered and mutilated by the Nazis. Yeah. Like horrific. And how you can come out of that, like with that kind of attitude is beyond me. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it just shows you, you know, we always want to focus on controlling everything, but that's something else that the wilderness I think teaches is like, you are never in control. All this man versus wild crap, like, oh, I'm going to go out there and conquer the wilderness. Like, no, you're not. You're, you're just going to learn how to exist with it and like react to it because you're never going to control it. I think that's the biggest thing is coming back and realizing there's some things you can control and there's some things you can't. And why are you going to yeah. focus on what you have no control over? And even when we have civilization, look at the tornadoes that just ripped across the central part of the U.S. here and exactly. killed, killed dozens and dozens of people and destroyed all kinds of property. And yeah, right. even then, yeah, you've yeah. got you've got everything that you need. And then nature says, hey, f <laughs> yeah, control is an illusion. But it's yeah. like, OK, it's what's next. Like, what do you do in response to that? That's what is important. I yeah. think that that's what 
people should focus on. What's I mean, the scariest thing that's happened to you while you were out in the bush? Oh gosh. I mean, does one thing just jump out like all oh, this one time? <laughs> Pick your poison. Which one do you want to hear? Um, I mean, I think the moments that I have where it's scary, it's like, you don't realize it till afterwards. Um, mm. definitely some, some close calls crossing creeks. I had no business crossing that were too deep, too fast, too deep, too fast, too cold, all the above. Um, yeah. I mean, just moments where you get out and like, I remember getting out this one time and just having to like pat my body down and be like, you're alive, you're alive, you're alive. I just kept telling myself because I thought I was, I thought I was dead, but it's was like, it I wasn't thinking about it in the moment, but it's like, when I got out, I couldn't believe that I'd survived it. Was it cold? Oh, it was freezing cold. It was spring um, and it rained all day and a bunch of snow melted. And this place I'd crossed before, which was super sketchy, um, was now like almost impassable. And, a raging torrent. Yeah. And I knew that I didn't have to cross it, but camp was on the other side and I wanted to go back to camp because it sounded really nice. I could, you know, have all my food that was there and it was going to be warmer and all these things. And I just was like, oh, I'll figure it out. I'll do it. I'll get across. And uh yeah, it was a close call. I ended up like lunging for shore and just barely grabbing onto this like tree branch that was sticking out and being able wow. to like hang onto it and uh, pull myself out. Um, total adrenaline dump. I thought I was going to vomit when I got out because it was like, it was just such a release of adrenaline. Um, wow. But yeah, I mean, that that happens. I mean, hypothermia, I think, is something I experience a lot. Just um, That's all not of a good. sudden you're. No, no, it's not. <laughs> it's not at all. But uh, I spent a lot of time in some pretty rough places and I rely on just moving to stay warm. But all of a sudden you get in a situation where, you know, it's super slick because it's snow on uh, grass, right? Like the first few snows of the year and it's just slick and you can't go any higher. So you got to start going down and you're just slipping and falling in this cold slush and you can't move fast because you're, uh, you know, you're you're bawling so much mm -hmm. um, and it starts getting dangerous because there's cliffs and uh yeah i mean all these situations um being exhausted in deep snow uh, there's one time a storm hit i couldn't tell which direction i had to go in and i'm on top of a mountain uh it's day started out like 60 and nice and um eventually this this snow comes in i'm trying to get off the peak end up going down into snow that's chest deep and I'm falling through underneath all these blowdowns and little air pockets they have under them and just pulling myself out and then walking and then falling again and pulling myself out and completely soaked, uh, saturated in, in not only snow, but sweat. And I'm exhausted, but perfect, I, perfect recipe to die yeah, on a mountain. Absolutely. <laughs> a perfect absolutely. recipe. It's That's really the shit that that they write about in the park rangers say, yeah, there was this girl yeah. that came up here. Yeah, we found her with no clothes on because she thought she was burning up and she stripped her clothes off and froze to death in the snow. Um, yeah. But yeah, it was like one of those moments where you realize like your body's just telling you like, hey, just take a break. Just just lay down for a second. Just like catch your breath. Just like hang out for, for just a few minutes, just a few minutes. And it's like you got to fight that voice. Mm -hmm. and you got to realize that no one. I mean, even if I had had an in reach or an emergency beacon of some sort, if I press that button, if I make that call, no one's going to come and get me in time, right? Mm -hmm. Like I'm, I'm in the middle of nowhere. Like I'm, I'm getting myself out or I'm going to freeze to death. And it's always amazing to me when you think you have nothing left, like there's still gas in the tank. It's like, there's this reserve tank that you just don't know about. And I think at that point in time, if I hadn't realized that that existed, I probably wouldn't have gotten out of that situation because mm -hmm. I wouldn't have known it was there. I wouldn't have known it was possible. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that kind of stuff is, uh, it's like the moments that I love the most, because even though it's terrifying and, you know, you feel like you're, you, you could have died. Um, it's like, that's when you realize you're really alive. I think it's like, oh no, I'm mortal. Like I, time is valuable. Like this is, my life is important and I'm capable of getting myself out of these situations. Um, and at the same time, there's, there's no control. And I, I ended up there because I'm never in control. So it's like all these different, like, it's like empowering, but it's humbling. And it's like, I don't know, you feel alive because you almost died. It's like all these juxtapositions, but it's, uh, I, I just, I'm addicted to it. I love Would it. Would you be pissed with yourself if you died in one of those situations? Like, absolutely not. No, you'd be, you'd, you'd be good with that. Yeah, I'd be, I mean, I've had a good run. Like, I don't want to die, but I've like, I can't be angry about it. I mean, I think, 
I'm more likely to die by getting hit by some 16 year old driving her mom's SUV, texting her boyfriend. Mm -hmm. I really believe that. Like, I think driving a car is still the most dangerous thing I do. And I'd rather go doing something completely insane. Um, not saying it's going to be fun in the moment or that I want to, but it's just, you know, I think that the risk is just worth the reward. And it comes down to that is that for me, there's, I would rather go through life and have these crazy experiences and potentially have them kill me than go through life with that middle line of mediocrity where I'm just never really happy, but I'm never really close to death and it's just safe and comfortable and comfortably uh, numb. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Any wildlife encounters that are noteworthy? I mean, yes. Uh, I see tons of mountain lions and wolves have been my thing this year. Um, not, I mean, wolves are whatever. They're fine. Uh, mountain lions, I've had some really close calls of just standoffs with them where I'm like. Go back a minute. Wolves are whatever. What is that? So the so the listener and viewers understand what you mean by that, because there's plenty of they're people. Not they're not threatening at all. Yeah. Okay. They're not. They want nothing to do with with people. Um, they've. I've never once felt concerned about a wolf encounter I've had, and I've had a more than most people I know. Um, Talking three, five, a hundred. Okay, and uh, more, a lot. Never one time did a wolf make you feel scared. Yeah, there are never. very few instances I think recorded of wolves attacking. I think humans. there's two. In modern in the modern world here too since like the 1800s or something then you it's talk crazy. about the mountain lion the cougar that's a different animal altogether no pun They're, intended i mean and they are but it's like the the areas where uh or the situations where people get in trouble it's usually areas where they're they've been pushed out of habitat they're starving they're desperate mm -hmm. they're normally scrawny little cats um or you know that one viral video it's like a mother defending young which is classic but um if she wanted to kill him she would have and mm -hmm. i think in if cougars wanted to kill people, people wouldn't go in the woods. They're such amazing, effective predators and they're invisible. Mm -hmm. The amount of times that they're watching you and you never know they're there. Anyone who's spent any time out in any area where there's cats, they've experienced that and they never knew it. Um, and I've never felt threatened, but there's something about just being like close and having that moment where you're like, man, I am such easy prey. You know, like, do you realize how vulnerable I am as like this weak little human? Um, and the fact that they don't is just shocking to me. Um, but yeah, gri grizzlies around. Maybe we don't there. taste good. I, that's I feel offended. <laughs> I do. I'm like, why? What is wrong with me? Like, why am I not a part of this ecosystem? Like, I'm a bull elk is going to put up a way bigger fight than I am. But yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, Maybe. grizzlies though. Grizzlies are tons of grizzlies around here too, but. Again, it's just, um, it's, it's knowing how to exist with them. And it's, I think people get really nervous about them and not saying that's not justified. I think if you're, you haven't spent a lot of time around them and you don't know how to respond, then um, I, I, I always think a healthy amount of respect is good. But I also think that every time a person sees a grizzly, they say it's charging. And I don't think that's true. <laughs> I know that's not true. Um, unless again, it's just because they don't like me but <laughs> um, could, could be, it I know I'm be. way, I'm way more scared in, uh, you know, a, a city than I am out in the wilderness, but I guess it's just what you're familiar with. Sure. You got into knife making. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah. I, so I used to be a farrier. So I was a, a horseshoer mm -hmm. and I think the natural progression for anyone who's working with metal and likes to spend time outdoors is wanting to make a knife. Uh, so I was kind of messing around with it and, um, ended up just finding it really interesting. Um, like everything else I do, I feel like I know how to do it, but I am by far not the best person I know at it. You know, like I know how to do taxidermy, but I'm not going to open a taxidermy shop and I know how to make knives because I know how to use knives, but I'm not ever going to be a full-time knife maker. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's something about making your own knife and that process. And I think kind of what it, you know, people for hundreds and hundreds of years have been making knives and the ability, thousands even yeah thousands even um the ability to get to connect with that and like see what it takes if do you have else. one of your knives handy uh god i feel like i should somewhere 
I can't believe Maybe. there's not one in arm reach, arm's reach. No. Yeah, I know where some are in the other room, but uh, that's okay. yeah, yeah. It's it's just something like it's really it's it's really fun for me to get to do, and I don't do it all the time because I spend way too much time out in the wilderness. But what does um, somebody learn if they buy your book? What are they going to be able to? Well, the book's a funny story because I actually had started writing a survival book and then my publisher asked me if I'd be willing to do one on knife making to which I responded, well, I'm not the best person I know. I'm not this expert. And they were like, well, that's perfect because you can write the book that you want to have. And so that's what I did. I basically wrote a book for someone with no experience whatsoever. Um, hmm. And, you know, where do I even start? How do I, what tools do I need? How do I use mm -hmm. the tools? Um, so from start to finish, uh, making a whole knife, um, no like folding knives it's all like fixed blade knives mm -hmm. but you can literally get my book and make a knife i've had countless people send me pictures of like hey i had no idea what i was doing but i made this it's so cool there's something about your first knife it's just that's like, super cool yeah the uh tools required how much money does somebody have to invest to follow this book i mean i spent a couple hundred bucks it's not a lot and it's there's different levels you can take it to you know you can make a if you want to do just grinding and like stock removal knife making versus forging with a you know fire and anvil um but if you do want to get a forge you can make one for you know under under a hundred dollars just really like a couple fire bricks and a, a thing of propane or a um a, like a little furnace i mean you, there's a million things there's old sales that happen all the time all over the country you can go and like find an anvil sitting in someone's barn you can use a piece of uh uh like a railroad um you know, the actual piece of the actual track, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you can use all these different things. And I kind of go, I kind of outline all that in there and just what the options are, depending on what level you want to take it to. But there's no reason. I mean, when I wrote that book, I was traveling. I went to my friend's place in Maine on his farm, set up a forge there from nothing, um, barely had any money to do it with and literally wrote the entire book with just the tools I got and the setup that I made at his place over the course of a week. Very so, cool. Yeah, it's 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 something it's accessible to anyone. It doesn't Somebody change. finds that book where? So it's all over the place. I mean, any a lot of bookstores now have it. You can get it online on Amazon. Um, pretty much any anywhere books are sold. Okay, nice, <laughs> nice. That's funny. Talk a little bit about your time on the television show. You've been on there three, four times, something like that five actually strangely. five did you I ever know. did you ever tap out and quit oh god no i don't know how to quit okay all right except for college <laughs> that's why i'm yeah proud. you've already admitted that on camera so yeah yeah um yeah it was you know for me it was all about just the experience because i live survival but i don't live survival where people are putting rules and restrictions and um you know it's different like to go out hunting with a bunch of camera guys that are there and try to still get food and try to work around that challenge. So mm. it was like a different kind of challenge for me because I was, you know, the survival part was not challenging. The the part that was challenging was dealing with, um, you know, more of the drama from cast and crew both. Um, and reality TV is a weird thing. I think it's as real as shows get, but um, there's it's definitely still a TV show and they're definitely there to make a TV show. So sure. It's, is a strange experience and i'm grateful i had it but um it's one of those things people are like well, why don't you go back they're still filming and they're still asking me to film but it's like i love new things i love learning and like challenging myself in different ways i don't want to go and beat the same dead horse like i know i can go out there and do it and at this point i've figured out how to play that whole game and i don't it's not exciting for me anymore and time being as valuable to me as it is i can't rationalize why i'd want to spend my time doing something i've already done sure so um yeah but it was it was really interesting it's weird um you know just being on camera when you're also going through a very real situation um and it's also interesting to see how other people react and you can always tell the people who have really you know been through some shit and the people who it's their first time in any sort of uh stressful situation and uh, it's kind of fascinating to watch that unfold and like just witness it up close and be like, I, re Man. I remember when the, at uh, this, whichever, I think, was it the first one, that, the first um, season? Yes. Thank you. That mm -hmm. you were on. Yeah. So the first one, I remember I watched that. I don't watch a ton of television, but um, 
I remember I watched some of that when it would be That's on so funny. the partner of yours. How did he do? Was he, are he you guys well, he, friends? Are you still friends? Um, we're not in touch anymore. Um, of course I'm like barely in touch with anyone just because I I'm seldom around a phone these days if I can help it. Um, he, I wasn't you know, sure if there'd be like a forever bond after weeks of crying together and um, picking lice off each other and stuff. With some people there are, and with some people like, it's like a cool, like that was fun. High five. Um, I think there's, there's a sort of bond, but also it, you appreciate your alone time. Sure. <laughs> like I, I really, I've always gone out and done these things by myself. And so it's always, it's always different when you're doing it with someone else and seeing, you know, just the level of experience I think can be hard. Like if you, you can be a great survivalist in one location, but if you haven't traveled and done it in different places and then, you know, my mindset is like, I'm zero or a hundred, either I'm crashed out or I'm going. And hmm. so when I'm out there, I'm like, there's always a way to make my situation better. I'm not going to be the person that is good at conserving energy because I always want to be doing something and making my situation better and trying to create those opportunities for myself versus, you know, someone who just wants the bare minimum to just scrape by. Pretty analogous to life in general, isn't it? For sure. Some, so people, if you haven't watched this show, there are folks that they're tactic or strategy is just build a shelter lay in the shade or in the warm spot and and get skinny as slow as possible over the course of it and hopefully the bell rings and they're still laying there right that's kind of what you're exactly. saying exactly okay exactly. and you're out like knitting freaking scarves and shit yeah out of... yeah i made alcohol out there in the philippines like you did I oh yeah i'm like i want to have a party like i want this to be great like we're gonna have four so you've made food. alcohol before like in jail or something you made like in jail, toilet yeah hooch. yeah for sure <laughs> but you've made you've like you've made some primitive hooch before to know how to do it yeah actually in college with the same anthropology professor that um kind of taught me how to butcher and all that he um he used to make his own wine and beer and so i kind of like picked it up then and then had a conversation with another uh friend of mine about um you know what it takes to do it in a primitive situation and i'd never done it primitively before but i'm like man you're I just using time. like natural yeasts that are in the environment exactly right? yeah i use the yeast from the uh, sugarcane plant okay so yeah that like cloudy for anyone who doesn't know that like cloudy if you look at blueberries and grapes a lot of time it has that like i don't know it's like a kind of cloudy powdery looking stuff on it and that's okay yeast. so after you that's yeast yeah okay so after Didn't you sterilize that. the, you know, whatever, I use coconut water um, and sugar cane. After I sterilized that and boiled it, I just cooled it down, put a little bit of that in there and then sealed it up, a um, little breathable grass ring and uh, waited seven days and it was awesome. It was great. What it taste like? It tasted like really strong, like a, this is going to sound weird, but a combination of beer and sake. That sounds delicious. It was delicious. And yeah. did it jack you up? Oh yeah. Because I mean, I hadn't had alcohol in forever. And then on top of that, it's like, we're not eating like anything that's, we ended up not eating as much that day, even though we had limitless bananas and just getting drunk. Oh really, God. Really limitless really bananas bad. sounds horrible. Yeah. Yeah. It's a whole, it was a whole thing. Constipated but, and dis Oh, the opposite. Bananas. So we were getting green bananas and cooking them and they taste exactly like oh. potatoes. So you're like, yeah. this is delicious. Yeah. Like, I'm going to eat 700 of them. That's um, horrible. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> but, that sounds horrible. <laughs> um, so you guys got drunk. Did yep. you, did you like taste it a little bit at a time to make sure you didn't go blind or anything? No, I trust, we trusted it. I can't Just, believe the, the guy I was out there with trusted it too, but um, bottoms up. Yeah. And the next thing you knew it was gone. I did save a little bit that I turned into vinegar and I made hot sauce out of that. Cause it's like snails don't taste very good. We're eating a lot of snails at the time. So I want to have some what sauce. did you get to make the hot sauce? You found some type of chili or something. Yeah. There was like an old abandoned farm there. And there was like one lone chili plant with these tiny little chilies on it. So I had that, I had the sugar cane and then the vinegar. And then I uh, distilled salt from the ocean to make salt. And it was really good hot sauce. I put a little bamboo container I made and very industrious the the time. You know, because I just don't like suffering. I could have just sat and eaten. Yeah, nails and you're walking them. around. It's like Gilligan's <laughs> Island. You got a bamboo container of hot sauce 
That's pretty that hilarious. <laughs> Did you bring that bamboo container home? I actually have one of the bamboo containers because I had a salt shaker too that I made because I wanted to take salt. They made us leave the beach. So I wanted to make sure I had like a stash of salt and hot sauce for the rest. Of Why the did they make so. you leave the beach? Um, I that was mean, just part of I the construct of the show. I have to say, but yeah, I think maybe some people were doing too well and it doesn't make great TV. I, I mean, see. I'm sure that wasn't really the case. Gotcha. <laughs> and, and, and the NDA must be up if you can do that. <laughs> That's funny. I mean, I didn't say it. I just, you know, that would potentially have been something that happened. But um, also, you know, the the change of seasons was a problem. Wink, wink. That was in the Philippines. Yeah. Where that was the fish plentiful and oh yeah things things to eat. Oh yeah, we were getting tons of fish. Um, we'd have like snake. I'd, we had lemongrass, so I would make like a snake lemongrass stew, and then we'd have fish on the side, and then what kind of snakes? Know, um, all different kinds, a lot of non-venomous snakes there. They had a venomous green viper, um, but just all, I don't need, I'm not even sure. No one even there identified them. Like, I didn't know what they were. I, I had no idea. I feel bad. Don't know what they were, but I just ate them. I just ate them. Yeah. That's yeah. delicious. What is something that people, uh, that, let me rephrase that. What's something about you people don't know about you? What's something you'd share with the world they don't know? I think a lot of people don't know that I have like one pretty intense fear. Oh, and yeah? it's like the only thing I'm scared about, but I am like petrified and horrified and like it's my biggest fear in the world. Man. Um, no, it's I don't think you'll ever be able to guess what it is. No, I just said and like oh, go go um, on. Vomit. Hmm. So what do you mean by fear? Like like if you're like, like diagnosed phobia. Like you're on a bus somebody hurls all over jumping the floor. out the window i'm out no shit I'm jumping out of a moving bus absolutely i'm terrified no shit. i haven't thrown up as an adult last time i threw up i was five years old and i can't throw up because i'm so scared of it and uh i've had food poisoning i've had you know all the things and i can't throw up um but when i'm around it i will like jump out of a building i forgot who told me a story the other day but dude pretended to be sick and he had taken a mouthful of like dinty more beef stew oh. in front of a bunch of people and puked it all up. And then he's like, it, there was there was something to this story. Somebody just told me this, but basically it was him sobbing, going, I'm sorry, shoving the stuff back into his mouth, oh, like eating it. I'm saying, I'm sorry, mommy, and eating the so people like are all freaked out like what the hell's wrong with this person i've got a story so my sister and i um we went to christian school and the, the, the her and a girlfriend are at this like prom thing or in it it's on a boat on lake michigan this beautiful boat called the odyssey i know um people from chicagoland know what it is and uh, my sister's friend's date cancels like the day of so my sister calls me and says, can you go? I've got four sisters and six brothers. So this girl I knew from, from our life. So I like run out and I get a tux real fast. And uh, for a bunch of the kids involved, like we grew up pretty sheltered church life where I was like the Hellraiser. This was like a big <laughs> deal. So we're in this big stretch limo. It's May, unseasonably hot here in Chicago. And one of the girls, who's now a comedian, like a legit comedian. Um, she's got this huge flowy, you know, prom dress on that's super hot. And like, it's like layers, you know, like puffy. And she's got her back to the driver up in this big stretch limo. And we're having a good time. We're in traffic. It gets really hot. The uh, driver has to turn the heat on because the, the limo is going to overheat. So now it's getting hot in there. We're stuck in traffic. Anyway, she ends up all of a sudden looking at me and saying, could I please have one of those vomit bags? And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I grab it and I hand it to her and she immediately grabs it, pukes in it. The thing fills up like an airbag, pukes everywhere, everywhere. Actually, that's I got part of the stories wrong. My back was to the driver. She's at the back of the limo. And I'm like, oh my God. I'm like trying not to laugh because it was just all so comical. Her date, whose name was, I don't want to say his name. He 
jumps onto the lap of my date because now puke's almost getting on him. So I shove my whole body through the window by the driver because I'm laughing my ass off. And uh, it got like worse. We're then in an hour. It's like 100 degrees. There's puke oh everywhere. And God. she's got a white dress on. And I'm trying not to laugh. We had to stop at a McDonald's. And she's I've had nightmares like this. Oh, uh, well, I literally was like, I helped clean it all up because I you could. I mean, I don't like vomit. I've worked in an emergency room and helped like old men with impacted fecal matter and oh, shit, me too. So. That's fine. I don't mind any of that. You don't mind That's shit, but vomit. Not at all. Huh? No, no. I've I used to work hospice. I've That's I've, weird. Seen, I've seen it all, but it's That's the vomit. Weird. I know. Very specific. I wonder where that started. Maybe you should talk to somebody. I have. I mean, I've been seeing therapists my whole life for it. So I was like a nutcase when I was a kid. You know what titration is as a biology student where Uh you can slowly poison yourself a little. I think we just need to expose you to little instances of somebody just puking on you. Oh, no. See, just a little at a time. I had to start watching videos. That's what I did. I started by people watching vomiting? videos of people vomiting. So, you know, Tosh, the comedian. Sure. Tosh, him? Daniel Tosh. He, Tosh. Yeah. He did this like <laughs> bit where he did bananas and Sprite and then put people on an amusement park ride and they're laughing and they're just projectile vomiting everywhere. I watched that oh, like a hundred times. It was so therapeutic for me. Like it helped so much because they were having fun and they were puking. So it was great. What I, happens when you puke? I don't. You never vomit. I was five years old when I last vomited. I haven't as an adult. So you've never got hammered and puked or you just oh, doesn't. No, I have. I've had horrific food poisoning where literally everyone else is projectile vomiting. And I can't. Actually you just will puke. yourself not to. Yeah. And I feel horrible for way longer than anyone else. Weird. Terrible. And I well, want I... to emotionally. I just can't make myself. Hmm. Yeah. Very specific. That's interesting. I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, yeah. Now everyone knows my Achilles heel. Just bring a Hey, this is a bag of puke. Give me all your money. I'm out. I'm yeah. out. Done. It's disgusting. That's <laughs> disgusting. I guess everybody's got something. I've I've met um, a kid recently that uh, blood. The talking about blood would make him oh, yeah. like he'd freak out. I'm glad I don't have that. No, me neither. Yeah. I mean, I don't like love blood, but it most definitely doesn't bother me in like a I mean, I'm not into it in a weird way, but I I like yeah. blood. Like it's fine. Um, yeah, I, I, don't, I mean, like it's not like I like yeah. blood, like yeah, okay, like I'm gonna like rub right it around, yeah, my yeah. file around my neck. <laughs> <Right>. Like <laughs> I'm yeah, by blood. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, but it's kind of convenient to have a like a very specific choke on my phobia. water. I know. Say, say that, that again, it's convenient. Well, it's convenient like to have a phobia like that because all of my fears are compressed into this one tidy little bundle. And it's like, I don't have to be scared of anything else. It's just the vomit. So when that comes up, it's inconvenient, but it's like, man, nothing else, nothing else touches that. So I'm not really hmm. scared of anything else. It's kind of nice. My wife just told me a story the other day. We went to a re- local restaurant. She'll probably be pissed. I tell it, but <laughs> we're, we're in a, uh, we're going into this restaurant and this restaurants near the grade school she grew up at. And she remembered being by this certain area outside the restaurant and being like in line and she ate something i think it was fruit roll-ups and she remembered not feeling good and like telling the teacher and then she's puking and she remembers like seeing it all on the ground and it was just a goofy story like but it impacted her as a little girl so there you can think about (laughs) fruit roll-up puke oh my god yeah no i'm gonna think about all the puke it's funny like you know if i was ever in a public situation and you were there you'd be like looking at the around the room trying to like assess you know what people were up to and what they were doing and thinking and i'd be there trying to assess who was about to puke hmm seems like a waste of life i know so weird get over it yeah how how do you earn a living um that's a great question (laughs) so i i have a tv show on carbon tv um so that's kind of like what I'm doing full time, but I do a lot of different teaching gigs as well. And What's Carbon TV? It's an online network. Um, so basically it's like free TV online mm-hmm. and uh, being able to do a show on there. I don't have to, you know, go out and do something and have it kind of staged and created from What's the show? another producer. I get to like produce it. It's called Decivilized. Decivilized. It's basically survival backcountry skills that I, it's, 
amazing videography because I do a lot of it myself. But I was about to I say, have, who's doing videography? I have videography? a great cameraman, Heath, who does a lot of stuff for me. But when I'm actually way out, I am the worst actual actual um, person at filming. because So you come back with a bunch of shaky ass stuff yeah. and they try to turn it into something. Yeah, he he's a magician. He can make it work. And it what kind of cameras that, do you take with you? My cell phone. Cool. That's it. And I usually cool. use like an antler or a bone to prop my camera up because my tripods always break because I'm cheap, I guess. I don't know. Hmm. I really just don't want to carry a super heavy tripod. So, I have one I'll send you a link to that's I've traveled all around with that's pretty durable. All right, good. Mm -hmm. I, I need I need and some, it's tiny some options. I mean, you can like wrap. It's probably like 80 for everything, but it's yeah, light. It's, it's like it's like less than a pound. I've just been like treating the ones that you get for 20 bucks on Amazon as disposable and it sucks. Well, that's stupid because they're break. I have one yeah. uh, that's like four pounds, though, that I take with me on all of our training. But that's four pounds. That's a lot yeah. in a backpack. Yeah, especially like a month's worth of food. But yeah, it is what it is. I like but, it. Yeah. So, so TV show, book book teaching so just teaching um i like to not do the same thing over and over again i like to do different groups different demographics different um events i just i people like people pay you to come and teach or do you like put a seminar up and it's open enrollment how, how does that work um like people will either hire me to come and teach something somewhere or like specific i've done a lot of like one-on-one -on -one stuff and even not survival stuff but backcountry skills just because you know, a lot of people want to get out and be in wild places, but they don't know where to start. So I'll go and, and take people out and kind of um, show them what I've learned so they don't have to make the same dumb mistakes I made. So you were doing this before Discovery found you to ask you to be on the show. Mm -hmm. um, do most of your clients find you because of the TV show? Honestly, no, at this point, I don't really talk about the TV show that much. It's more like some, a lot of people that I know and work with or have taught don't even know that I was on it. Um, it's really just been word of mouth. It's pretty incredible. Like the whole old fashioned word of mouth thing. Um, mm -hmm. but I think people still talk to people if they have a good experience. So if you can facilitate that, it gets around. Um, do, do you have like a demographic that your average client looks like? No not yeah. at all which is always shocking to me it's oh, oftentimes people you like the least people you least expect um and it's all over the map do you ever have an issue like men wanting to learn from you i have a really uh great uh, i call her my handler but she kind of screens everything before it gets to me because in the beginning there would be creepy people that would see the show and then try to arrange something and then be like you misunderstood i that's a good question i was saying more like I'm gonna learn anything about the outdoors from a girl you but your question I, that you're posing so you ever have oh, that yeah. some guy that saw you on tv with yes fuzz over your privates that's like oh yes. like, okay so you get that yeah and then you're saying so your question was do i get people who are just like like just sexist yeah yeah you know like I, like i'm not gonna i'm not gonna go talk to a girl about <laughs> you know uh, well, being out in the woods i think if i think um luckily i haven't had to be sold to someone like if if someone hears from word of mouth they're coming to me before i ever know about any of that situation when I was first starting, I got that a lot more, especially from the survival community, to be honest. Like I found the survival community pretty awful um, to the point where I really don't even call myself a survivalist. And this is not across the board. This is talk just about what is the survival community? And it's there's, you know, there's your primitive survivalists that do more like, you know, back to the land kind of stuff. And then there's uh, like the kind of prepper survivalists who are like, I'm going to have my go bag and I'm going to have everything ready for a bad situation. And then there's everything, you know, and then there's the bunker people and then there's everything in between the bunker people. The bunker people. <laughs> <laughs> I know some bunker people, but it's just oh, funny God. because I've never put names to these people. So the bunker people, yeah, the, yeah. there's definitely the go bag people, the mm -hmm. bunker people, the back to the woods the people. Hippies. Yeah. yeah. They're yeah. all like all of them. And I don't really fit in in any of those groups. And I think when I kind of, first realized there were other people that were doing this. I was like, this is great. And then I'd show up at some event. I remember some event I showed up to and some guy just walks up to me and he's like, hey, little lady, like, let me show you how to use the bow drill. And he's like trying to show me like I've never seen it. And I'm like, man, I've been living in the woods for like 
five years. Like, you just think I don't know how to do any of this. Like, cool, yeah, show me what to do. And it, there was definitely a lot of assumptions that were made. And who knows if people just are used to being a big fish in a little pond or if it's because I'm a chick, I don't know. Um, but I think there there's definitely um, people who kind of make judgments about that or think that, you know, I just do it for the gram. I think that's something that people in this world are really suspicious of. But um, none of that really bothers me anymore because I'm like, cool, come out with me. Like, I will break you. Like, I dare you to come out with me kind of thing because I just, I know what I do at this point. I know what it's really like. And I think what I'm showing publicly is like one tenth of how insane it really gets because when it's really crazy, I'm not filming. Um, Why? So I think, because you can't be? Oh, yeah, because I'll die. Like if it's a really intense situation or, you know, I'm not carrying around a, a cell phone, like cell phone. Why don't you get a freaking GoPro and a Chester head mount and get some better freaking footage? I mean, I probably should, but then I got to like carry that and think about it and turn it on. And I mean, I can do a better job, but I'm never going to capture all of it. No. And that's, and that's, and that's part of that would go against what you're trying to do with your life too. Right. 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 Cause then you're always living. I mean, there were years I refused to even have a picture of myself. Cause I was like, I don't want to live through the camera. I don't want to be thinking about it. And now I, I want to share it with people, but it's like, there comes a point where it starts becoming about the footage instead of the experience. And then that'll take away from the footage I do get. Cause it'll be me. I can't eat this meal until I take a photo of it. Yeah, exactly. And then mm -hmm. all of a sudden it becomes about me and my ego. And that's a whole other weird thing that uh, makes me really uncomfortable. Do you have an ego? I mean, we well, all I do. Think we all do, but yeah. I, I think uh, the wilderness keeps me humble. Um, I think, you know, I don't like, uh, it's very hard for me to self-promote or, uh, I don't know, sell myself and talk myself up. It's not because I don't have self-esteem, but it's like, it just feels weird to me. I think it's just when I watch other people who don't um, have filters with that, it just makes me uncomfortable. Well, those lack of filters is because they don't have self-awareness. Yeah. 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 Tell me I'm wonderful. Tell me I'm beautiful. Tell me I'm awesome, et cetera. Yeah. And yeah. it's easy to get lost in that world, especially just when people live for social media. Mm -hmm. And then it gets back to the whole, you know, my whole kind of trying to, the way I try to live. And it's just like. It's a bit of a dichotomy because you have a large social media following. And so this, you're having to like feed yourself and mm -hmm. this animal that's required, the animal of social yeah. media. Yeah. And it's, it's great because I mean, I've connected with some incredible people. I've been able to, you know, it's so humbling to get to share my experiences and have people want to see them. Like, that's really cool. And I'm mm -hmm. like, honored people would take their precious time to watch or, you know, ex like interact with whatever I'm putting out there. It's really, it's pretty amazing. And at the same time, there comes a point when, you know, you're like, oh God, do I really have to like take a photo or a video of myself out here right now? Like, is this weird? Like I always kind of look at myself from a third person viewpoint and I'm like, oh, I don't want to be the person who's like taking a picture of themselves. This is awkward, but then it's how else do you share it? So it is, mm -hmm. it's like this weird line that you have to kind of toe and dance around. But um, I think as long as I'm, I've come to terms with the fact that as long as I'm being authentic and as long as I'm just being me and putting that out there, then it's not selling out. It's just sharing something. And if someone can take something positive away from anything, then that's great. I'm going to throw more positivity into the world because I uh, dig it. There's not a lot of it. it do you have, uh, how am I, let me re think about how I want to phrase that. Do you get people that don't like what you're doing? Like, yeah, hey, you're fake or. Um, Something. I've definitely had people come on over the past and be like, oh yeah, she's doing that for the picture. You know, it's, it's not often, I think it's less now, like the past few years, I haven't gotten it. But when I first started sharing what I did, there would be plenty of people who'd be like, oh, she doesn't know what the, what the hell she's doing. Like she's just took the picture. Um, and that would always just be like, I mean, there was a point in my life where it definitely bothered me. I think when I first got on social media, I was kind of a latecomer to social media and I was like, what? Uh, you know, you want to like defend yourself or something. Mm -hmm. You don't understand what it's like because you've never been attacked like that before. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, I went through that for a little while, a number yeah. of years ago, where I finally just had to. You also, 
and you may disagree or agree, I don't know, but part of I, I my whole point in social media is passing on information. So when I see that, I take it as me doing a poor job of relaying whatever information I was trying to relay. So mm -hmm. it's not so much of like telling the person they're wrong. It's like, well, I must have done a shitty job of even if it was a joke or something that was meant to be humorous or sarcastic, yeah. like if they, and then I get it. Now I get some people are not funny. That person just doesn't have a good sense of humor, so they can because I'm not going to waste totally. my life trying to help some yeah. stiff that doesn't get a joke or no, or get into an argument back and forth online and like mm -hmm. let emotions get involved. I mean, for me, like if someone says something, I have a lot of uh, like international fans and oh, a lot well, of like oh, oh well I'm very that's exactly how I heard that I'm I, you I have a lot that. of international fans <laughs> well no but like a lot of people I'm that just actually kidding. strangely just watch kidding. the show like they're you know they're from different places so sure oh god no I'm comfortable it was um, a joke it was a joke uh, no I'm just kidding um but anyway they don't know what hunting is here they don't they see me with antlers that are shed and they think I'm hunting or if I do mm. post something about hunting they don't they're not in the same climate that we are and they don't have like the same kind of views and information that we do and mm -hmm. hunting might not be a thing in whatever country they're in and all those international fans mm -hmm. i have so uh it's one of those things where i see it as an opportunity to just educate someone and be like hey i'm really sorry that you feel that way like this is where i'm coming from with it here's what i'm you know what i what this means to me and you're totally entitled to your opinion and 99 percent of the time they come back and they're like wow that's actually really cool and uh, I remember I, when I worked at the taxidermy shop in Colorado, it was right next door to a, yo a yoga studio. And there was girls that walked by every day and they, it was kind of like this feud. And one day a girl kind of poked her head in, I invited her in and we had an hour long discussion. And by the time she left, she was like, man, my husband and I have always fought about the fact that he goes hunting, but I think I'm actually gonna ask him to take me with him. Um, Cause she just hadn't ever thought about it. And she put up this wall and wanted to fight against it. And she just never, thought about it in a different way. Hmm. Um, I think you can go crazy trying to explain to people and try to win them over to your side or whatever. But sometimes it literally is just they don't know the facts. And mm -hmm. if you want to come at them at the wall, they're going to put a wall right up. But if you can just break it down a little bit and be like, hey, this is, you know, this is how I see it. How do you see it? Then a lot you were a non meat eater once, right? I was a vegan. I was a straight up vegan. Yeah. How yeah. long? Uh, years. I was a vegetarian years. for like six years and then a vegan for a couple of those. And um, yeah, I mean, I really was just like horrified by how gross the meat industry was when I really looked into it. I did a report on slaughterhouses because I loved meat so much. So it wasn't that you thought like meat is murder. You just didn't like how the meat was yeah, well, raised. Just, and Yeah, I just it wasn't the fact that I like didn't want to consume an animal. It was like, man, what is that system? And then I realized mm -hmm. how much more messed up the, the agricultural system was and like farming and just not on a smaller scale, but you go down to, um, you know, Central America and you see the deforestation that's happened for, you know, a lot of it for us and yep. things that are being exported. And it's like, how are you feeling so self-righteous, Laura, when you're creating this? Like, what animals are you just happy that you don't see on your plate? They still die but you just don't have to see them and look at them and you think you're doing the right thing. But right. if I'm living in the Northern, like a way up North and I'm eating vegetables in the winter time, what is that? What is the cost of that? And uh, it was a big you know, I mean, turning point for me and starting to hunt and realize people don't like home. hearing that. No, it's a travesty no. that tomatoes are flown around the world or oh. the fact that we can get a banana any time of year, Anytime. anywhere is insanity. And that a lot of them end up in the garbage to rot, just so we mm -hmm. can always have the perfect ripe ripeness of banana that we choose. Mm -hmm. That was, I used to eat out of a lot of dumpsters and the amount of food that I got, I could be- You say some funny shit. I, was, I used to eat out of a lot of dumpsters. I did, <laughs> that's I did okay. I mean, I'm, I'm okay with that, but that's funny. Yeah. yeah. It, yeah I just it was, was watching this documentary on uh, cruise ships it was something that came up on netflix so i'm like oh that's interesting like it was like all about how the cruise ship works and they were they were with the guy that's in charge of all the food and it was pretty amazing logistically it was tons of food that has to be put onto the ship in like a six hour window and then the ship leaves and then you know they do their yeah. thing but um he inspects everything or people do in this truck came with like 
pallets and pallets and pallets of pineapples. And there was one bad pineapple. And so he says, he calls them up and he says, get all this shit off my dock, bring a new truck. And I'm sure a lot of it still got used, but Mm -hmm. like, because they don't want it on the boat unless it's perfect. They don't, and part of it is they don't have the time to mess around with it, but right. Yeah. We just, we just toss the stuff. Toss it. And I mean, I could be selective. I'd be like, I only want to eat organic dumpster food. And I could do that. You could do it. That's how much waste that there's a cool documentary on people doing that. Just living there. I mean, it's it's totally possible. Now they have like Mm -hmm. these compactors that you can't really get inside, but it's still the trash. I know. I know. Made it a lot harder. But anyway, yeah, I realized like what's what's better that what I can see and I'll just go and face that and understand it and like. It's not like I'm just love going out and killing things, but I love hunting and I love like killing my own food and that connection to it. But I just didn't know. And then I got information and I knew and I made choices accordingly. And mm-hmm. I think there's definitely people out there that just want to hold on to what they believe in and not question it. But I think there's still people that are willing to question that. And when they, mm-hmm. they don't want to question anything that you might question them about, they just want to be right. It's not about learning it's not about being open to maybe they don't know some information they just want to be right and if you give them new information they think you're telling them they're wrong and then it's like this whole thing i think a lot of people do that but not everyone Uh, the hard thing about the whole discussion is like folks talk about companies like monsanto or um mass farming and they look at it in a negative light there would not be billions of people on the world Mm -hmm. if it wasn't for modern farming techniques herbicides and all those things that allow us to get the yields per acre but then again like there's a trade-off for all of that which is decimating rainforests and shipping right but we we do play a big role in what we expect everything to look like when we get to the supermarket and Mm -hmm. even like stuff that's i was watching something about a guy that runs a big peach farm and i think it was over half of his peaches never make it out of the orchard yeah because they don't look appealing or apples same thing people want that apple even though there might be an apple that's got like a weird thing on it that's still completely edible and delicious but mm-hmm. you want that perfect thing. Well, and it goes back, I mean, to what we started this whole thing out on, right? It's like everyone wants everything at their fingertips all the time. And if it's not there, there's a panic. Mm. And it's like, that's I a mindset. Yeah, it absolutely is. And it's a way of just figuring out how you're going to relate to that. Mm-hmm. You know, I think with the food thing, it's like, I don't care what anyone else does. I just do what I do and what I believe in. And Keep that's talking. like just how I exist. And I think everyone needs to do that. They just need to figure out how to relate to it themselves. If that makes any sense. But what if people's relationship to it is still in a negative way? Like I had a friend of mine on the show here a couple of weeks ago. His name's Jeff. Him and his wife, Kara, own Colorado Craft Beef. So they're like, his wife is a fourth, fifth, sixth generation rancher. They own a beautiful ranch in uh, Eastern Colorado and it's um, craft raised animals. It's a small herd. The animals live like a very nice existence out on the open range. And then one day Mm -hmm. they're dead. And that's, you know, like people are like, oh, that's terrible ending, but it's delicious meat. It's what's in our freezer here for beef. And it's, uh, it's, it's a nice family story, but little ranches like that can't supply all the beef requirements or red meat requirements and if everybody went out and started hunting white tails and elk there was yeah. no freaking white tail at the turn yeah. of the century in america we decimate them again oh yeah yeah no i mean and that i think that's part of the problem i mean i think and i don't know how to like solve all that but there's there's got to be better solutions i think part of it also is like understanding it and just being informed i mean there's some there's some really cool things there was some place i visited back in georgia and they had fish like it was tilapia and they were somehow like swimming in the roots of plants i don't i don't remember what it was called it was some whole weird thing like they were growing like lettuce and stuff but they were like tilapia swimming in the roots and it was so so much food was coming out of this tiny little place and it was just feeding itself and i'm like man that's so cool and i don't know what i mean to overhaul the entire system it's not going to happen and what a luxury to even be able to talk about doing something like that like there's people who are lucky that they have food on their plates at all um but, and I think it's like, I'm not the person who's going to solve that problem, but 
when people are going and criticizing other people, like we're all doing the best we can, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's a lot of things in this world that could be overhauled in a massive way, but I don't need to go and attack other people and other people don't need to come and attack me. And it's like, make the choices I can, but I'm also not going to um, be a martyr um, in a huge way. And I think that's- So you're not going to trade your cool time here to- <laughs> To, to help the... the world no no i'm way too selfish for that <laughs> what does this mean on your hand oh so that's a tree it's a cedar tree that uh i lived under i still go and visit a lot uh did you take a wilderness. photo of it and then have it turned into a yep so a it's tattoo? not perfect but uh it's her so you when you see it it reminds you of this place yeah it's like the one place it's home just that tree is home that tree's home how, so how much time have you spent underneath a tree, that months, tree? Months and months. Months and months? Yeah. What state is it in? Montana. Montana, okay. Mm -hmm. Super cool. In yeah. the secret place that you in, won't in name. In the secret place that I won't name. <laughs> it's good to have a place that you can't tell people about. That's a good thing. It is. It's nice. And it's not like I'm selfish and want to keep it to myself, but it's like, I don't know, something's got to be sacred, right? Sure. I agree. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> Every time I have somebody on the show, I ask them if there was something you would leave people with that if they never heard your name again, never saw your face, never met you in person, what would you leave them with? Hmm. I think the biggest thing is just looking at the parts of your life that when you think about them, you're unhappy and just sitting and thinking about ways to be creative and ways to flip your excuses over and examine if they're real or not. I think if everyone could do that, if everyone could just kind of examine why they're so upset or what in their life makes them the most unhappy and just think about it in a different way from like a third person perspective, non-emotionally, non-attached and try to challenge the excuses that you have and, uh, and just change things for the better and do something that scares you. I dig that. I think that's such a hard, thing for the average human though to be self-aware enough to look at something we talk about this in our training program constantly because it was so such a part of my life and some of the guys I work with but to be able to step out of your own head to see what is because it's just like you don't watch your own kids or dog grow they just do it in front of you and you don't see all of those little things happening and I think it's so hard for us how, how do you do it how can you like look at what's making you unhappy? How does somebody do that? I just, I always imagine, I do it all the time in survival situations, trying to like analyze things like, hey, am I really cold or am I just emotionally cold? Am I gonna die or am I just feeling like I'm gonna die because I'm scared? And I literally just imagine myself stepping away from, I'm a very visual person. I just imagine myself stepping away and it's almost like I'm telling myself my problems. Like I'm a whole different person and I'm telling this person I am now what my problems are because mm -hmm. it's easy to give advice to someone else. Right. But it's hard to do it for yourself. So I just become that other person for myself. If that makes any sense at all. I think so. So you're trying to, you're like giving yourself advice from uh, the logical side of your brain. Exactly. Yeah. It's like the logical part is a completely different part and it's not attached it's like getting rid of those attachments of emotions and then realizing like even when we're doing that self-talk what if it is emotion and what's the fact even mm -hmm. just writing a list down like hey this is what's happening that are the facts of this situation and anything that involves feeling or things that you're putting onto that idea you don't include it's just the facts and then you're looking at just the facts and those you can work with it's the feelings that get confusing and that's where people get wrapped up and why they can't help their own lives, even if they can help someone else's. But if you can step away and completely remove your emotions from that, then break it down, make it a very analytical thing. It feels kind of sterile and cold, but it can create massive change mm -hmm. because you're not just guiding yourself with the same emotions that you've been using for the rest of your life, you know, that got you there. Mm -hmm. You're looking at it from a completely new perspective, and then you can make decisions based on that that'll actually help you instead of being stuck in that same rut. I like it can't know where you're going if you don't know where you is amen mm -hmm. i like <laughs> it how do people find you i am most active on instagram okay. so at laura zara is my handle there 
And L A U R A Z E R R A. Uh, you got it. Uh, you can also find my show Decivilized on Carbon TV. Easy way to do that is just Google Laura Zara, Decivilized. You'll find me. And your book, Google. I, I know when I was doing a little research on your backstory and found out all of the amazing facts, uh, there's tons of stuff that comes <laughs> up so people can. Yeah, um, my book is A Modern Guide to Knife Making, and uh, you can find that online or in bookstores and uh, make a knife. It's really fun, even if you only do it once. I think that's a, I, I, I've never actually made a knife, but I've made uh, made bows. I've made all kinds yes. of things like that. So I, I definitely dig that. I appreciate you taking the time. I'm sure you're busy. I know you've been out in the bush. I it asked you a long time ago to do it and you uh, I thought it was like that you were like, ah, I don't want to do it. So I appreciate that you you made the time to uh, share with the uh, higher line listener viewers. Uh, you guys that listened, if you dug it, share it. Go follow her on social media. If you guys are into making knives or want to learn, it'd be a good gift idea. It's uh, what about 10, 12 days before Christmas. Go buy one and give it to somebody. Okay, Actually, my nephew who loves knives, I've been trying to figure out what to get him. Yes. I'm going to I'll buy him the book. I love it. Yeah, That's I'm awesome. going to do well, it. Well, thanks so much. It was super fun. Thank you. Of course. Visit our website, kerrytrainer.com, for information about classes held throughout the U.S., Kerry Trainer Apparel, and upcoming projects. You can also email us at training at kerrytrainer.com for information about setting up your own private course or speaking engagement training at carrytrainer.com or carrytrainer.com. Hey man, what are you doing in the podcast room, Steve? I'm writing a national anthem. It's going to be at folk festivals for Gunfighter Gun Oil. Oh. Bob Dylan, it was like a, it was like a love story. <laughs>